Welcome back to That's Rugby Podcast. Uh, my Hurricanes fucked it. They fucked it. <laughs> they quite royally fucked it. Um, yep. oh, uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about the. First of all, here we go. There's what I'll say. Congratulations to the Chiefs. Chiefs played a very good game. Uh, I don't want to take anything away from them. But my Hurricanes fucking sucked. Um, what a way to put on your worst performance of the year. In the most important time, very hurricane like, um, yeah, which is no surprise there. Um, I yeah, I just sat there and uh, I think the Chiefs came with an absolute gem of a defensive game plan, and even the commentators noted on it. Um, rush defense from the outside in, and it worked well. Uh, hurricanes weren't able to hold on to ball because of the pressure that the Chiefs were exerting against them, and then when we got opportunities, we decided we were. Uh, going to play American football and throw the ball forward about three or four times. So, look, I am so disappointed because, as I've said all year, with no Crusaders in the finals, we, slash any team, has an opportunity to win the championship. We had home field advantage. Chiefs were 0-4 in away finals. Hadn't been us um, at home for uh, away for a while. We had all the makings of a winning run. Blues were going to have to come. And we blew it. We just there's no other way to put yeah. it that we we fucking blew it. Um, I think, in, in the in the terms of the game, I think we actually got quite lucky with the refereeing. Um, I thought Angus Gardner refed a hell of a game, um, but Sam Benny Finau got a yellow card, which I think was rightfully done. But it's one of those ones again. Head contact. Then we had Luke Jacobson get a yellow card for a forceful off the ball hit, which. Again, you know, could have been a penalty. Yellow card was all right. And then TJ Perinara probably should have been sent to the bin and wasn't. Um, so, look, mm. I think we kind of got the luck of the draw with the refereeing and just everything and still managed to fuck it up. Um, Wallace Atiti, I think, uh, the number eight for the Chiefs, 21-year-old, had the game of his life, um, made some monumental plays uh, through the middle. And in be all, end all, um, as a Hurricanes fan, 19 points... In the semi final, when I think we averaged, I think it was like 28 ish above 28 points for the yeah, just wasn't enough. And as the Chiefs did, they scored 31 against us, and we just we weren't able to, to back it up. So it's gutting, absolutely yeah. gutting. Um, but yeah, the Chiefs now move on to the final where they will face the Blues, who who ran over the Brumbies to a point. Yeah, look, that uh, yeah, it's sort of the expected result. Um, I watched part of the game, and I, I, I've seen some of the highlights, and I've also, you know, followed along with watching other people's takes on the games and things like that. You know, tried to to get a good opinion. Look, there's no doubt the Blues were the better side; they deserved their spot in the final. However, some of the calls in that game, I don't think it was as well refereed as the Hurricanes Chiefs games. Not as consistently refereed, anyway. Which I think is what more we're asking for. You know, um, is, is consistency is 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 the key. You know, if you're gonna interpret something one way, you gotta interpret it that way for the whole game. Um, or consistently, at least in the time that you're refereeing across the across the season and things like that. Um, so I think the Murrays might feel a bit hard done by there, but I don't think that they would argue that they should be in the final over the Blues. I think especially what exactly what we said last week happened. You know, set piece play, scrums, the Blues just dominated. Um, you know, it was enough for the the Brumbies had enough to get it done against the Highlanders at home, not enough to get it done against the Blues away. Um, I think it's it's never been never been clearer that this is the time to to split the comp. You know, I think like we've lost the rebels. We've had this conversation. And I think we'll talk about this probably a little bit more as we, in, in a later part of the podcast. But look, it's just it is it's just it's, something needs to change because at the moment the way that Super Rugby is running, it's just formulaic, rinse and repeat, um, no excitement, predictable results. Uh, for the most part, I guess I don't know how many people would have predicted the Hurricanes to to lose the game against the Chiefs, but you know maybe some hardcore cu- Hurricanes fans could have seen it coming. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, look disappointing for the Brumbies who want to get bowed out at a semi final. Um, tough for them, especially with all the injuries and everything that they've had to suffer this year, along with a lot of other Australian sides as well. To be fair, um, and yeah, congratulations to the Blues. Now we got a really interesting final of the Blues hosting. Uh, the Chiefs. So the two, the last two runners-ups uh, facing off in the finals. 
Um, both are finally getting their shot to play a final, not against the Crusaders. Uh, they're both be thinking this is our time to, to get it done. Um, you know, um, and look, the most recent game between these two, it was only three weeks ago that the Blues hosted the Chiefs and beat them 31-17. to 17. So I think the Blues will probably be thinking, uh, will be feeling pretty confident heading into this final. Yeah. I um, yeah the the just to quickly touch base here on the Brumbies I think losing James Slipper before the game um, it was just that was uh, set the set the tone I think it was hard for them yeah. if you can't win the battle up front as we always say chances are you don't going to win the battle um, so yeah then the Blues now have to be careful for because they're going to get, get they got what they wish for um, as Finlay mm-hmm. Christie said up the Chiefs. Uh, after their game so that they could host a final. But but sometimes you've got to be careful what you wish for. And I said mm-hmm. it last time, I think the Chiefs learned from last year. Not all roads need to lead through Chief Country or your home ground, as the Crusaders have done the past two years. You make the grand final, it doesn't matter where you're playing. <coughs> you're playing at a high enough level, um, you can definitely go all the way. And as we saw from the Chiefs, you know, it takes a couple of standout performances, Satiti, mm-hmm. um, Amoni, Amoni Narawa um, having another fantastic performance as well. You go, a couple of guys do things like that and, and you're in. And, you, and they did it without Sean Stevenson as well. So yeah. DMAC ran the ship really well. Um, so I go, Blues, as much as, you know, home field advantage up front, no Tupolotu, no Dalton Papali'i. He's been ruled out um, because he failed his HIA in that Brumbies game. And so I think it's a 12-day stand down. So... They are starting to lose a few influential players, um, mm. but they'll go in as favourites, rightfully so. But I, it, it's going to be—I think it's going to be a lot closer than that thirty-one seventeen because I think the Chiefs are ready to bring everything to the game. And Clayton McMillan, the Chiefs coach, has said that the biggest issue for the Chiefs, and, uh, and if they can solve this before next week, is keeping fifteen players on the field. I think mm. it was something like the past six games they've had a yellow card, and they had two against the Canes. Obviously, able to hold on. Um, but if they can keep 15 on the field, the Chiefs are, are right up for this. And I would actually just about say that their back line's got more X Factor on form than the um, Blues. But saying that, you've got Mark Talia on one wing and Caleb Clark on the other. So that's, that's never easy to shut down. Um, we're gonna, let's jump into that um, discussion of the splitting of the comp because mm. uh, the CEOs, I think, are, are, are planning to meet or, I don't know, it's a head... Head, head men in Australia and New Zealand are planning to meet um, to discuss domestic comps and how this can all work and if there is a right pathway for Super Rugby. Now, I read it previously, just a really good article about a... The, the, just, again, being as the Blues were, be careful what you wish for with a domestic comp. And the reason that he's saying that is back in 2021, obviously you had the Reds, Brumbies, Finals... I think it was twice they had when you had Rugby AU. There was two finals, both the same teams playing against each other. If say we had stayed split, and the reason it said this in there, I think it was in since two thousand and three or something like that, two thousand and four, we had nine different Super Rugby champions, which you don't think is a lot, but you know that's twenty years, nine different. You know, once every two years mm. is a different winner. In the MPC, um, the New Zealand Provincial Comp, um, there has been four different winners since then. So we sit here and we say we want to make things more competitive, but would we arguably be going for a fifth straight Reds-Brumbies final was kind of what the article was saying. Like, I know the Reds had one ba- bad year of Fawn, so maybe the Waratahs get in that year. But, you know, what is it? There, 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 to me, there isn't a lot of change. If we go domestic, and I, I haven't felt, I've, I've, I've been on the train of we should look at splitting the comps or doing conferences, yeah. doing something like that. But, I, I like the idea of not completely splitting the comps, having like the comp together, but there is conference. So you have like a Super Rugby mm. AU final, and then you have a New Zealand final, and then you have the ultimate final, very much like the NFL yeah. with their conference. But yeah, it did, it did make me think, are we, do, do we just have to be careful? Because I know the NPC, like, like he said, is the, the big cities win, and just because we go back to those. like I, So many people call for us to get the All Blacks back in NPC. I don't think that brings the fans back instantly. Like, there's a lot more work to do yeah. than just that. But your thoughts I on think, that? I think, yeah, look, um, I, yeah, I, I, I think the 
that's that's it is that's what we've been arguing for is that the, the final should be a australia versus new zealand final type deal um with a super rugby au and super rugby nz champ um I think yeah, I, I agree. Look, even if you split the competitions, I think that's that's not the whole solution. You know, I, as I said, I've called for um, expanding the two conferences to include more Australian and New Zealand teams within that, so that way the pool of competition is expanded, more players get exposed, um, and so it wouldn't just be you know the five Super Rugby AU teams in one conference, five Super Rugby NZ teams in another conference, or you know including Fiji and Moana Pacifica amongst those conferences. Um, is you've got to do more work to develop the brands here in Australia. Um, at the at the end of the day, though, and this this uh, look, uh, th- this is just my th- thoughts on it, and and feel free to disagree. But you ha- for for Super Rugby to continue, you have to do what is going to be best for rugby in Australia. Because if you lose Australia and the and the Australian viewership over time that will eventually degrade the new zealand teams and new zealand offering as well right um you know the uh it is just it's just simply that having not having that opponent that constant rivalry to keep the all blacks on edge i think would make the quality of new zealand rugby suffer right um so i think at the moment australian rugby is in crisis and what needs to be done in super rugby and in rugby au as a whole uh is to address those issues and to ride that ship and super rugby needs to play a part in that so i think if super rugby wants to continue then they need to be looking at what is going to help super what is going to help rugby australia right the ship what is going to help what is going to make a good competition in australia that people will watch and enjoy what's going to get essentially what's going to get bums in seats and eyes on screens right that's what they've got to be got to be looking at and yeah that's you know just getting the stars back to those squads or whatever is not going to do it. I th- it, it it's going to require a massive overhaul it's going to require a concerted effort not just with the on the field product but as i've said for many long weeks and i'll keep saying with the off the field work as well the marketing sales departments uh broadcast deals all of that stuff needs a massive overhaul because at the moment it is not good enough for a for the peak level of rugby in australia the absolute darth of any kind of media coverage outside of real really independent productions such as us you know the raw sports uh uh they're not independent obviously but you know but a lot of rugby podcasts even foreign-based podcasts the majority of rugby news that i see does not come from nine does not come from stan because the way they curate it is is horrible right the majority of rugby news i see is from uh independent folks going out sourcing the the situations and getting that news out there compare that with rugby league and afl the biggest providers of news on those fronts with the breaking articles and things like that uh fox league nine's wide world of sport and then the afl equivalents of that right there is just there is just such a poor um amount of and look, Nine is the is the official provider of rugby in Australia, right? Because it's on Stan. But they only ever put things out through their Stan channels. There's nowhere near the viewership numbers on Stan as there is on Channel Nine, an actual free to air TV station. Um, there's not, never anything in the news about it, right? And that's partially because of Rupert Murdoch's uh, vendetta after rugby was taken away from Fox that he's declared a, a jihad on on rugby news and that it will not compete with nrl he's made his you know personal mission because his ego has been bruised right it's partially that but it's also just partially that uh you know no one's no one from rugby is bloody pushing these networks to to put their news stories out there right like like channel, as i said channel is the official broadcaster of of rugby show but it's all been pushed through stan right what a fucking horrible mistake that's been that's just been terrible for for rugby you know it's like i would have to get stan and i would also have to purchase the sports subscription how many people out there know that oh you could actually just flick on channel nine and it's there on one of those nine channels you know so yeah look it it, it, there's there's a whole heap of issues at play here right um and i think splitting the competition or any moves that would change the competition 
that needs to be that nothing of that will solve or fix the issues it's got to go hand in hand with a media and marketing strategy right that i think is the number one thing the ceos of rugby australia rugby new zealand super rugby any of the bodies involved need to be doing is getting people talking about rugby now we've had some articles out there recently right you know Suali'i coming over is a, is a good example, right? Uh, but also with the expected return of the Lions tour to be over $100 million, that's getting people talking about, oh, okay, that's pretty good. You know, selling out a lot of those games is, if not all of them, is, is huge as well, right? But again, those stories are getting talked about in your nightly news and things like that, you know? Where are the injury updates on nightly news or on these media channels that we see for NRL, AFL, etc.? right? It's just not there. It's just not happening. And it's it's pretty shameful from on rugby's behalf, to be honest, because they're the ones that should be grilling these media types who are apparently supposed to be the broadcast partner of the of Super Rugby. And they're not they're not talking about it. Right. Um, and it's just, yeah, I don't know what's going on there, but it's just not good enough. Not yep. good enough at all. Yeah. And and yeah, it'll be interesting, I guess, where where they go and where conversations are going. Because, yeah, the product in New Zealand's good. And as in this article it said, it said, well, as much as we can say, yeah, split the comp, it's not competitive enough. Say the Brumbies did the unthinkable and beat the Blues, they would now be hosting a Super Rugby final in Canberra against the Chiefs. And you'd, they would go in as favourites as that with a potential to win. So we are not so far off competition I don't think the issue here is the competitiveness I think like you said it's actually how do you get more people in Australia watching because we get it in New Zealand and mm. you can see you know the the difference between the crowds in Hurricanes versus Chiefs versus Blues versus Brumbies when you've got two New Zealand teams playing more people seem to be interested in that obviously makes sense so uh, I imagine there's going to be lots of conversations around that. But this mm. leads on to our next point as well, which is the French, uh, which is doing a bit of a snub of the New Zealand tour next year. So French are meant to be uh, touring New Zealand. But, and this shows the difference, I think, of the thinking of where Super Rugby's at and where the French top league's at. Because they are not going to take... So the French top league starts in like August, late August, I think. And it runs all the way through like it's just... I think their finals are coming up. So they have literally July off. July, part of August. They have like six weeks off. So it's a, it's a long league. Obviously, they take breaks over Christmas and they do a whole bunch of mm. other stuff. But So in that July period, they've decided they're not actually going to send their top squad over to New Zealand because a lot of those players are only getting their breaks mm. and they would rather them work with the clubs and be around for the clubs um, to get ready for the season. So they have said already, you know, a whole year before the tour happens, that they prefer the players to be ready for their league. That in no world would ever happen in Super Rugby. You know what I mean? So there's a difference. Obviously, a lot more money flying around in in top 14 league, a lot more um, commercial value running around in top um, 14 league. So I see, I get all of that, and I know it's different, and we're comparing a bit of apples and oranges, but... That's arguably now you can say that the French top 14 is the best league in the world. You know They hold the Champions Cup um, trophy with Toulouse. Uh, they deliver week on, week off with packed out crowds. How we get Super Rugby to that point where we go, you know, we, we, we all know international rugby is the, the pinnacle of the sport and I think the French know that, but one-off tests for them isn't as valuable as actually their... Club rugby is. And I don't know if Super mm. Rugby will ever get there. I'll be very surprised. I think the, the brand of the Wallabies, yeah. the All Blacks, is too much. But it is one of those as, things. As, that I think as well, especially because it is in New Zealand, that, um, you know, the, the the viewership probably isn't the same as if it was in France, right? You know, so uh, I, think it's the, I think that plays into it as well. It's very much a commercial aspect to it as well. And I... I wonder as well with Super Rugby, do we need to extend the season and make it longer? And well, yeah, it's it's a tough one because I'm I'm of like, hey, sometimes a short season's better. Like you get in, get out, but yeah, we we look at NRL, so we're about to have our final. NRL have still got what two, three months of of, yeah. of the season left, and I go, I know, like, why can't we break for the July tests? 
uh, again, the calendar's a bit skewed, but because the rugby championship then comes up, and I, I'll, I might discuss this as a point at the end, I just wanted to bring up, but I, I just look and I go, if we can somehow say the rugby championship is at the same time as the Six Nations at the start of the year, then we go into Super Rugby, take a break for those mid-year tests, mm. then we finish up in, say, August, late August. You know, then our players get a break until November. Um, they can play for us. It's the NPC if they have something there. Mm. Um, I just think, yeah, the the season needs to go for longer because it makes sense. Then that that will build the product. The more games we have, the more product. Yeah. Like we have what fifteen but, rounds? Yes, yeah. Uh, but you got to think as well that NRL also has a whole lot more teams. And I know, look, I'm probably a lone voice in this. I know from from, from some of the comments I've seen. People call me crazy. That's fine. You can call me crazy. But if you want to, it's, it's all about interest. It's all about like people actually wanting to watch the games, right? If you think about the competition, right? We've got five Australian teams, five New Zealand teams, one Fijian team, one Pacific Island team, right? Uh, we've got a total of um, 12 teams of the competition. NRL has got now 17 teams looking to expand to 18, 19, right? That is that adds a lot when you have that many teams, and also Super Rugby is losing a, a team now as well. So I think you have limited number of there's a limited number of matchups you can have with twelve teams or even eleven teams, right? I think that makes it less exciting, uh, less interesting as well. Yeah, just just and to, to be able to expand the season is yeah, it repeating so many matchups. Well, the, the, and that's top fourteen. You play everyone twice. Home and away, 13 yeah. games, that makes 26. Like, yeah, I agree. Like, it has to get to 14, it'd be a minimum. Like, I don't think you, like, even if we do 12, you're only playing everyone twice. Even that, 12 rounds, uh, 11 rounds, do that twice, 22 games in the season. Like, it's doable, but I think, yeah, I agree with, with, with the point you were going down. Yeah, I think you got to get, you think you got to go back to, you know, I would love to resurrect the Super 15 brand and, um, and have 15 teams so that way. Uh, there's what seven games a week with one team having a bye um, at a time, you know. Um, I think that'd be that'd be great. Um, yeah, look, and you could play everyone twice, or you have your domestic competitions. Um, you know, there's ways to do it. There's definitely there's definitely ways to do it. It just yeah, it's not it's just not great at the moment. There's just something's just got to be done. I don't. You just can't. Uh, you know, at the at this point, it's sort of like. I don't really care what is done. It just something needs to be done because it, the worst thing you could do is nothing. I think that's that's the that's the probably worst option that could be undertaken is if we keep going down this same path that isn't working. Right? It's not working, and we look, we've just lost an Australian Super Rugby team. Clearly, it is not working. Um, so, yeah, that as long I, as something is being done. I wanted to pitch this idea. I'll jump in now. I wonder, like the rugby championship happens every year. I get that. What if we didn't do it every year? What if every four years between the um, rugby world cups? And the reason I'm asking this is, and all saying this is just because the Euros are on, and the fanfare around the Euros has been absolutely insane. Like everybody is up for it. Like it's buzz. Now, say we said a seventh hemisphere tournament so mm. Argentina Uruguay Chile all come you get South Africa Namibia you know you get Fiji Samoa all of those Tonga, so Samoa, yeah. you get it, I know Japan not Southern Hemisphere but we take Japan they're the odd ones out say we get all of them and do like every four years do a Southern Hemisphere tournament even if we did it every two years minus a World Cup year or something like that um, could that you know fit into the calendar there instead of the Rugby Championship and then we, we obviously still have the Bledisloe games. And then if we're doing these yeah. South African tours, like I get, I, it may not make commercial sense. I just saw the Euros and was like, our international game, yeah. is, as much as it's loved, can we spread it out and make our club game just as yeah. well? Yeah, look, I think, you, I, I, think you would, I think you would be burning one of the few valuable resources that, um, that rugby has left commercially if you take away the rugby championship because those that that brings viewership and bums on seats right that's the, the probably the most 
successful product of Southern Hemisphere rugby is the is the rugby championship, right? Um, but I do like your idea. That being said, I do like your idea, and having a tournament like that, I think, would be great. Um, you know, the fans in the Pacific Islands are super passionate, super super passionate. They will turn up for those games. We've seen it in Fiji uh, this year, and we've even seen it when they play here in Australia, when the Dura play here in Australia. The fans uh, come out. Um, so I would like to see something like that, uh, but not at the cost of the rugby championship. Um, what if we did yeah. it every four years and had a short, another shortened? So like, as as the rugby world cup goes, you go, uh, what, you only play team once, so it's a free round rugby championship. So say if we did this Southern Hemisphere, you know, you have. What was the last World Cup was 2023. So you have World Cup mm. shortened the rugby championship. In 2024, full rugby championship play everyone twice. 2025, shortened rugby championship. Have the Southern Hemisphere tournament. 2026, full rugby championship. 27, shortened rugby World Cup. Something yeah, like it, that, could it, work. that. That that runs in with a British and Orange Lions tour. As well, uh, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah look, so what calendar's you, already what pretty you full. Could, <laughs> yeah, what you could do is you could have, say, Rugby World Cup, year off. British and Irish Lions Tour, Southern Hemisphere Tournament, World Cup. And the Southern Hemisphere Tournament is like the year run-in, it's like a year build-up to the uh, Rugby World Cup. You know, it's like a real sort of test of that. And then that, that gets these smaller Pacific Island and Southern Hemisphere teams some chance to play against some quality opponents that they don't, won't otherwise get a chance to play against until a World Cup, get some more practice and improves the quality of their rugby. Um, so maybe maybe that's an option. Um, and you just don't have a rugby championship that year, the rugby championship forms maybe part of that tournament in some way. I'm not sure. Or it's just skipped for that year, something like that. Um, yeah, look, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of options. You know, there's a lot of things that can be done, and that, this is one of the advantages, as we always say, that rugby has over NRL, is that it is a truly international game. Um, and, and look, Rugby League, to their credit, is they're building that as well. So rugby's got to act to capitalise on it while we still have the advantage in that regard and to, to build more of a lead and to build um, the this, this sport back up. But, um, yeah, as I said, at the moment, it's just, you know, the direction it's heading is down, and I don't think anyone would deny that. I think in Australia, you're correct, but I don't, in New Zealand, that, this, this, is the, this is the interesting story, and I guess this is why we are probably at different ends of the spectrum just a little bit, but because in New Zealand... Attendance is up in New Zealand. Viewership is up, mm. so it's it's not not working in New Zealand. Yeah. Um, but as you said previously, if we just let Australia die, we'll cause and issues. We, we, and we, we're, in, we're inevitably joined at the hip, you yeah. know, as countries um, and as sporting um, codes. You know, it's just it it, it is a it's a fact. Um, so yeah, look, um, I, I'm sure that it is being worked on. I'm sure that we're you know, it's not as if we're um, Cassandra or Troy or anything like that. We're the only ones that can see what's happening. I'm sure there are great, greater minds out there working on these problems. And I'm sure there's a whole lot of stuff that we don't know as well that goes into these decision makings. I don't doubt that. But from where we're standing on the sidelines, this is the this is the opinions that we're offering with the information available to us as members of the public. Yep. Totally uh, agree. Hello, ladies and gents. Husey from That Rugby Podcast here. If you're a Hussute man or woman like myself, man here you'll know that being hairy up top means you're naturally hairy down low you don't have to have the biggest bush outside of a national park though and manscaped are here to help you achieve your manscaping dreams kate bush might be running up that hill but with the manscaped performance package 5.0 ultra you'll be trimming up your pill in no time if like most aussies you're heading somewhere warm this winter you don't want to be sweating up a storm in the summer heat so make sure you're ready for smooth sack summer join the 10 million men worldwide who trust manscaped with our exclusive offer Get 20% off and free shipping when you go to manscaped.com and use code RUGBYBOOTH, all one word, at manscaped.com. Now, Manscaped were kind enough to send us here at the Rugby Podcast a care package of the Manscaped Performance Package 5.0 Ultra, including a free bonus set of very comfy Manscaped boxes, which I will not be showing here, and this stylish shed travel bag. Now, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra is the star of the show, reducing the risks of below-the-belt nicks and with dual spotlight LEDs to illuminate the darkest reaches that not even your partner has seen. 
Now, I've actually used this recently, and I was surprised at how easy and comfortable it was compared to my previous manscaping attempts in the past. I particularly liked this uh, new foil blade to finish up areas I wanted particularly smooth and ready to groove. After a nervous start worrying about nicks and bits being caught in the blades that you definitely do not want caught in blades ever, I was able to get a bit more comfortable and shave to my heart's content. The only one not a fan of this was the bin that had more than its usual load of hair to dispose of. Not only does manscaping with the help of the lawnmower help perfect your package's presentation, it also helps reduce the risk of ingrown hairs. Now, after trimming and going about a long day's work, you want to keep yourself fresh. And the Crop Soother Aftershave Lotion and the Crop Preserver Anti-Chafe Ball Deodorant are just the ticket. You'll be able to toss a few snags on the barbie without your own snag roasting in its own juices and smelling like someone's chucked a shrimp on the grill instead. Now, get 20% off and free shipping with the code RUGBYBOOTH, all one word, at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with the code RUGBYBOOTH, all one word, at manscaped.com. It's all one word, all capital letters. It's smooth sack summer, boys. Get on board or get left behind. Um, last point for today as we wrap it up. The uh, South Africans take a 1-0 lead mm. into the series before the series has even kicked off against Ireland as Ireland went 0-2 in the URC playoffs. Um, Leinster losing to the Bulls in South Africa. Um, so a lot of jokes being made about the Bulls beating in the Irish team um, already. So that's 1-0 kind of. And then... Uh, yeah. Munster losing at home to Glasgow, um, which is big as well. So 0-2 for the Irish teams, 0-2 for Leinster in um, trophies this year. Again, similar to last year. There's three years in a row that Leinster have been knocked out in the semi-finals, um, which now makes sense why they're trying to sign Geordie Barrett because don't they love someone who gets knocked out in the semi-finals? Wow, (laughs) Geordie Barrett, welcome to the team because fuck me. Um... Yeah, uh, that, that that builds up well. I mean, I know Zebo, one of the uh, former Irishmen um, from playing from Munster, has added some more fuel to the fire by saying that Razzie hates Irishmen. Um, so we're just getting more and more context as we lead in because next week we get the first bit of international rugby dripped on us, which is Barbarians against Fiji and then the South Africa versus Wales game at Twickenham. South Africa with a... I don't want to say rested side because they've got like 11 injuries that won't be yeah. um, playing from the World Cup side that won in that Welsh game, which, again, as we it's a, it's a warm-up game. It's a, it's a test match, so again, but it is. It's a warm-up pre the series of the, of the summer, um, which is Ireland versus South Africa. Um, but, yeah, that's about us today. Um, short and sweet. Yeah. Um, but we've got a final next week. We've got two finals that I kind of want to hear your thoughts on. Um, Blues versus Chiefs, obviously the big one. Blues hosting, who are you going there? Hmm. It's tough for me because I do love Damien McKenzie. Um, so I want to say the Chiefs. I want to say the Chiefs. However, that scoreline from two weeks ago has me worried for the Chiefs. A two, two try win for the Blues. It is in Eden Park as well. So that has me worried for the Chiefs. Um, I am going to go with the Blues. Yep, I am going to agree with you. Uh, Samasoni Takiyao already ruled out. I know the Blues missing a couple of influential players, but I just think that Type 5 has been on fire. Um, I think they'll replace those players and they will get over the line. And I think I don't think it'll be as comfortable as that last one. I think the Chiefs have got no. some, something cooking. And I, it wouldn't surprise me sitting here next week seeing the Chiefs victory and a Chiefs lifting the trophy um, but I, I just right now sitting on the outside knowing it's at the Garden of Eden it's hard to go against the Blues mm. and then the other final Glasgow uh, Warriors uh, facing the Bulls in Pretoria Pretorius um, mm. who you got there I am going to say my prediction first um, because I think the Bulls at home it's just a, it's one of those at altitude too hard to defeat Yes, I was going to say similar things, but you've encapsulated that there very nicely. Yeah, the only interesting point, Munster went and won last year against the Stormers in South Africa in the mm-hmm. final. So don't count Glasgow or the Chiefs out um, because they're two teams absolutely battling. Oh, mention, completely forgot this. I want to talk about it. Carter Gordon. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, uh, look, I mean... Made sense it was going to happen, especially after um, 
the um, rebels were shut down. Um, sounds like that there wasn't a um, spot for him in the in the Waratahs, which you know I guess they're going to roll with um, Tane Edmund for next year at ten. Um, what I'm hearing from my internal sources is the fact that there's no coach played a part on his yeah. decision making, um, which I get. It's hard to go to a team not knowing the direction of the team yeah. and who's going to be coaching. The, the speed at which it happened made me definitely feel like it happened during the season and couldn't be announced. Like We heard rumours of this during the season. Um, I think the, the whole Eddie Jones process coming into the new Joe Schmidt era kind of thing, um, yeah, is, is probably not been a great ride for him. Um, and I think a little bit of his, to be, to be honest, the, uh, his form this season has been disappointing. And so I don't think, you know, he was tapped to be the next great wall of his 10. And Joe Schmidt's probably said to him, you know, form this season has not been good enough to be my starting 10. Mm-hmm. And Carter Gordon, after being anointed the World Cup 10 for the Wallabies, has basically, you know, he's like, well, may as well go to the Titans as well. Apparently one of Eddie Jones' staffers as well put him, put the idea in his head. Um, you know, I, I'm not that surprised. And, you know, 12 months ago, this would have been devastating for Australian rugby. Now I think it's a, I think it's just like a side note. You know, I don't think, I think because a batch of good young tens has started to come through, that Carter Gordon is just less important than he was um, a few months back. Um, yeah. And, and look, his, I know the Rebels have been um, inconsistent all season, but in the Rebels' best season, this was one of his worst seasons in recent memory. Um, you know, he was still, you know, they were still good enough to get him into a finals, but especially when compared to last year, there was just, there was something that wasn't quite right with Carter Gordon. And I think as well, he's just not a goal kicker. I think just, you know, missing uh, so many crucial kicks is terrible for confidence. And that's not just ball kicking confidence as well. Um, you know, I love what I've seen of, out of Noah Lolasio lately and the confidence he's playing with. Um, so, yeah, look, I at the moment, I think it's not as big of a deal as probably, you know, some people have made it out to, to be. Um, so, I think this is yeah. a win-win for Aussie rugby, just about. Like, yeah. as much as it sounds strange, if Carter Gordon goes over there and is successful, like... I hope he's really successful really, because the amount of stick Australian rugby gets, like, oh, any Kangaroos player could walk into the, the Wallabies. If an outside Wallaby yeah. goes over there and absolutely kills it in league, um, it does send just a little bit of a message like, hey, you know, our, we do have quality players over here playing the game. And as you said, I think he was a 69% goal kicker this year uh, compared to yeah. Lolasio, who's like, 80 odd, 80 high 80s, um, and that's a difference. Um, and yeah, I from what I heard, yeah, the Waratahs, the issue there was no coach. Reds and Carter Gordon obviously have a bit of history. Two young Reds, uh, fly halves coming through as well. Western Force have Donaldson, Brumbies have Lolisio. He was kind of on the outer of anywhere. Um, I know he wanted to go back to Queensland, although I heard the stories that he wanted to go back to the mm. Queensland area with family and stuff. That's where he's from. It, it was. I think it's worked out well for everyone. Like, Carter Gordon probably needed a reset after what Eddie did to him. Um, and then gets his opportunity to put his hand up elsewhere. Yeah, look, um, to be to be, to be be fair to the lad as well, hope he goes well. I mean, you're probably hoping he goes well since you're I'm a hoping he fan, fucking so. kill it, it, kills it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it would be, yeah, look, it would be, uh, it'd be great for, for him. I hope it works out, you know, honestly. Um, I think he got a real raw deal last year. Um, and as critical as I've been of him this episode, I think that definitely played a part in it. Um, and it's just a real terrible situation for any young player to to be in, to be thrust into the action like that. So, yeah, look, best best of luck to him. Best of luck to him. That'll do us for today. We will be back again next week uh, recapping the final mm-hmm. of all finals. Blues is the Chiefs. Smiling D-Mac against Ang- Angry Rico Ioane. Um, who will come out on top. For now, though, thank you for joining us. Uh, I've been Luke. That's been Husey. We are That Rugby Podcast. We will see you again next time. Goodbye. Peace.